Good morning. Come on, I know there's very few people here today, but that's okay. Good morning. Very good. We've waited for them as long as we can, but we've got to get started. Amen? Uh, we've got a lot of notes on people uh, with, the, with flu, so uh, let's, uh, let's stand and join hands and let's pray right now, okay? <clears throat> Hold hands and stand in faith that you won't get anything. Amen? That's right. We are people of faith. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And we just speak healing. Uh, we rebuke the, the spirit of infirmity right now in the name of Je Jesus, Father. We speak to Trish. Uh, we say be whole in the name of Jesus. Flu symptoms be gone. Uh, that's just a testimony. Stop getting the flu shot. All you do is get the flu when you get the flu shot. Amen. Stand in faith. Dear Heavenly Father, we, we and look, if you're not there, don't, don't, don't do it. Do what you believe. Your, your faith in whatever uh, uh, God can do for you. If it's a flu shot, then do that. But I just don't. I, everybody gets a flu shot, that, and they get flu. So I don't get it. Amen? But if you are there, that's where you are, and, and there's no guilt or condemnation. And there's no guilt or condemnation if you're standing in faith either, flu people that have to get the shot. Don't make us feel guilty either, all right? A, 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 a guilt-free zone, amen? Okay, dear Heavenly Father, we love you, we praise you, we give you honor and glory. We just ask for eternal salvation, eternal healing, Father God. And we ask, Father God, for divine health in Jesus' name. Father, we just speak to each body that is being attacked with the flu. We ask for super strength and super uh, nourishment in their bodies in Jesus' name. Now, Father, we just ask that we have a service that encounters your glory, Father God, that we, that you would fill this place to overflowing, that you would cause us to come face to face with you. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Come on up here and let's worship the King. Go, guys, go.
I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to shout it out. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to dance and sing. I'm free, I'm free, I'm free to worship you. I'm free.
My favorite scripture, John 10.10. 10. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. Amen? I feel like there's some folks in here that the Lord is uh, saying uh, the enemy has come to steal it, to take it away. You have to grab hold of and fight for it. Amen? <clears throat> but the great thing about it is, is all that all you have to do is grab hold of and fight to uh, take hold of Jesus. You don't have to fight to maintain the promise. You don't have to fight to, to, the in, enemy away. You just def, you have to fight to maintain connection and presence with the Holy One, Jesus Christ. Amen? And He has come this morning to fill us. Amen?
playing, guys. Everybody pray, please, in the spirit. Tell him how much you love him this morning. Tell him how thankful you are for all that he has done. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for carrying us through the storm. Thank you for speaking peace to our storms. Thank you for paying the bill, Father. Thank you, Father, for mending the relationship. Thank you, Father God, for restoring. Father God, thank you for bringing health. Thank you, Father God, for tearing down strongholds. Thank you, God, for providing. You are worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We worship you, O mighty King. over and grab your neighbor's hand. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to come into your presence, Father. Father, I ask that on hunger and a thirst for your righteousness and your presence and your word, Father God, would increase. Father, our desire for you would increase. Father, that the disappointment, the discouragement, the apathy, and all the things that cause us to just to 
go through the motions or withdraw or that our hearts would be pricked once again, that we would have a fresh fire, that a new wind would blow upon us, Father God, that hope would be no longer deferred. Father, we would have a new burning desire and hope, knowing that you're going to bless us first and foremost with your presence and draw us into an intimate place and breathe new life into our lives, into our work, into our relationships, into our ministries, into just our devotion time, Father. That we would long to wake up in the morning and be with you. That before we went to bed, we would seek your face. All through the day, we would look for your whisper and look for your signs of speaking to us. That when we first, when we first got to know you, when we first got introduced to you, Father God, and and everything meant something, and everything that we did uh, 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 showed you, Father God. And every time someone spoke, you would hear, we would hear you, Father. Fresh and anew, Father. We love you, we praise you, we give you all honor and all glory. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Hug your neighbor, tell them you're glad they're here this morning. Squeeze them tight. Oh, ushers, come forward, please. Someone get the, the stand for Mama. Turn your neighbor and stick your tongue out at him. Goodness gracious sakes alive. I had an encounter with the Lord. Sorry. Hey, you got something in your ear. You got something in your ear. Sorry. Did your ears rattle too? Really? I wonder if that's what's wrong with mine. Uh, sometimes when it gets loud, it goes... <laughs> Anybody else do that? I hate it. I used to be a headbanger. I could rock out. Now, <laughs> yeah, that's what I do. I stick my finger in there. Or stick a finger. All right, y'all ready to give? Turn your neighbor and say, you get the opportunity to give to the Lord. Thank you for being so obedient, David. What are you doing back there? That wall is not going anywhere. He's security. You're supposed to be quick. If you're quick, they should make it past the door. Oh, okay. Yeah, exactly. All right, if y'all don't know, Billy's back there for the, any idiot that wants to come in here and shoot us or me. I guess y'all, he'd protect me. He might let him shoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm probably the only one they want to shoot. Huh? <laughs> so if you guys are nervous about that, just talk to me. But he is, uh, we need to be wise. We're in faith, but we need to be wise, right? All right. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your blessing, your your your, your substance that you give us, Father. We thank you for the opportunity to give back to you. And Father, we call these buildings paid for. In Jesus' name, Monday, Monday, Monday. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Okay, you guys got to stop looking gloomy.
Smile. Someone reach over and pinch your neighbor. Pinch the fire out of them. Pinch the fire out of them. She said she would kick my booty. Yeah, when we first met, I was—I always pick at her, and I was picking, and she was standing here, and I was standing here. We were in the kitchen, and I—she had that ugly demon thing face right there. She turned and went, "Bam!" I went, Ugh. "I didn't want to show her, but inside I was like, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! I can't feel my arm." No, because she doesn't hit me in the arm anymore. She hits me in the face. We don't want to mess this up. You're not doing your job. You're not taking care of me. Don't reach out. I'll give it to you when I want to. Go away. Stop it. Who wants him? Take him today. I need a babysitter for about five hours. Amen. I have no idea what he's talking about. Sorry. I guess I was, I was supposed to know. Oh, good morning. How's it going? <laughs> We're going to have to get hold of it again since my husband got all carnal and stupid for a minute there. Just kidding and not a lot. Um, how many of you, when right, right when we came to the end of that last song we, and we just let the music play, how many of you immediately discerned a, a change in the room? Amen. It's okay if you didn't. I'm just asking if you did. Um, because what happened, actually, there was, like, what I saw was, like, almost like a shaft of light that opened up. Um, and you know how, like, I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like if you were, like, uh, it was... Thick. And so, like, you would actually not see faces because once they got into the shaft of light, they just became light. Does that make sense? Like, if somebody was out here, I could see a face as it got close to the light, the face disappeared and became part of the light. And I really believe that the Lord said that it was the light um, was revelation knowledge. Amen. We need, you know, light uh, to shine in our darkness. We need the knowledge uh, of the Lord. Um, and before I forget, I had to put my son-in-law on the spot because the Lord told me today that I had to remind you just now that you have, you carry the spirit of Elijah. Um, and I know you're totally content being on the keyboard away with no microphone. And that's totally okay because even in your playing, though, there is that anointing on your life to cause people to stop halting between two opinions, uh, to turn sons to fathers and fathers to sons, uh, and to release the anointing for miracles. So I know you got a word about that long, long, long time ago from Eva Dooley, I believe, but I was reminded of it again today. He told me to remind you. Amen. During praise and worship, after I got the word, about the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. I felt like the Lord impressed on me that, I mean, the reason I'm saying it now is because she said that to him. We have too many um, 
sons and daughters that are sitting dormant, um, whether the battles have made you leery of getting in and doing the full of what you're called to, um, disappointment, um, not feeling like you can do what her and I do. Um, and there's some that that don't want to give up. You're, 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 you've got a little foot in the world. You don't do a lot of bad stuff. You're not sinning major stuff. It's just for me to step over and be here, I got to give up all of this. And I have been afraid to get back into the game. And so I know what you feel. But there's sons and daughters in here that need to allow God to, to call you out of the boat. And you, you need to get out and start walking on the water. You have a call, and it, it is it's stagnant. It's lying dormant, and the Lord is saying, come, come. And I'm not going to name you right now, but the Lord has shown me five of you. And the Lord's saying, come. It's time. We, it, strategically, it's time. The thing about Jerusalem is significant. If you guys don't know what that, that was about, but it was, it's significant. We're moving in a time, and don't wait until it gets to a point where it's crazy because then you are in fast boot camp, and it's easier to do it before than while you're fighting. Amen? You don't build a storm shelter in a storm. Amen? <laughs> Selah. All right. So um, I had a plan this morning um, about of what I was going to minister. And then we did Sunday school, um, which was really awesome. Um, I was really angry when I first started. We needed a serious spirit of God to come upon me because I was frustrated with all the technology and stuff that was going wrong this morning. Um, but... I decided to go sit in the office for a second, and I was just going to, like, just chill and ask the Lord, what am I doing? Um, and he actually just dropped something very quickly into my heart, and everything's just lining up so beautifully. I'm super excited about it. Um, and I know he doesn't show up in the presence like he did during worship unless he's ready to work in us the will and the do of his good pleasure, right? Um, the word alignment came up a couple times in Sunday school last week and this week, and I, I can't shake it right now. Um, you know, the best thing that we can do as sons and, our, sons and daughters of God is to make sure that when, especially when we gather corporately, that our focus is we, that we'll be perfectly aligned with heaven. You know, heather, heaven doesn't come down in t- to disrupt us. Heaven comes down to join us as we join him. Um, and when we are in that kind of alignment, you, you, you see the Spirit of God move in, you know, wonderful, amazing, uh, powerful ways. Um, and that's why it's real important. It's one of the things that we kind of, we, we think it's a weighty thing to, even if we have an agenda, to let God mess it up, right? So we could plan something for weeks, but if the Holy Spirit said, nope, you're changing it today, we would change it. Because unless we're following after that perfect alignment with heaven, we're not going to experience God the way that he wants us to experience him. Um, and I want to talk today out of Luke chapter 1. Of course, it's super familiar. And hey, Amy, I'm going to do the message Bible today, I think. You know, when you look at the Old Testament, if you will think of, these moments that we read about, um, especially the, the grand moments like creation, you know, um, Noah, uh, Daniel, all these things that we consider the, the huge things we you know, say about the word of God. These are the miracles he did. If we look at all those high points, or they could even be looked at as, as low points, um, we can see that there was an interaction or an alignment between heaven and earth, right? That God was speaking from heaven to men. He would come as an angel. He would um, come through a prophet. You know, he, he had many ways to speak to the people that we read about in the Old Testament. 
Now, if we will consider that to be alignment, then I want you to think about, because as, as they were in alignment, and as you and I say, like right now, we're in alignment. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a believer. I'm born again. I've been born of the Spirit. I've been filled with the Spirit of God. I've been baptized in His presence. And I now have what heaven says I can have. So I'm in an, an alignment that is actually more extraordinary than any of those past things we read about. As, as phenomenal as Noah and the ark was, what we have is far weightier and far more beautiful. And I think we forget that a lot of times. And if, you, if we think about Israel, you know, when, when we see the end of the Old Testament happen in Malachi, there is these, you know, 400 years of just total silence. I mean, like, I don't know if it's hard for you guys, but for like me, it's hard to fathom, like, heaven being silent for 400 years. I mean, because I talk to God every day. You know what I mean? Like, I, I'm, I'm, I'm constantly having conversation with him. I, I always feel his presence, not as powerfully as other times, but, you know, I can begin to pray in the spirit and, and be one with him in the heavenlies in an instant. So to fathom what a life would be like with no communication between uh, us and God, it's, kind of, it's hard for me to, to grab a hold of, even though I had that life before I was saved. I was so radically saved that the person I was, doesn't, she's, just, she's so dead. Like, I do remember not having any life and wanting to die. But the reality that I came into with the living God so far outweighed anything I'd experienced when he was silent in my life. But the crazy thing is, he wasn't being silent. He was actually speaking volumes. I just wasn't ever really open to see what he was saying to me. I've had encounters in my life with different people, with different believers, and when I thought back, I can hear things that they shared with me, and I didn't realize it, but God was speaking to me. So he wasn't silent. But when he came to Israel, he was silent. He didn't say a word, guys. Nobody in the world for 400 years heard or felt the presence of God. So you have to understand that when he now begins to announce himself, this is so monumental. This is an extraordinary moment in the world. As he begins to now send an angel, he sends Gabriel, the one who has a message, the one who declares what heaven wants said. When you encounter Gabriel, you are never going to get like the, the power of his presence to fight against you or fight for your enemies. You always are going to hear a word announced to you because Gabriel is a messenger. And why this is important is because even today, you cannot come into the presence of God until somebody has announced and a message to you that he's alive. Somebody, we say, well, faith comes by hearing, and yes, it's the same thing, but you have to hear the word of God. There has to be a message released to us. Now, I want you to think about all the messages you have being released over you every single day, not even from God. The enemy's hurling thoughts at you. Your own carnal nature is hurling thoughts and ideas at you. And in the midst of all that craziness, there's this whisper from heaven trying to get our attention. So I imagine, like, in this world where, you know, we see here in, uh, in Luke where, you know, Zachariah and everyone's just doing their things. They're all doing the mundane, everyday kind of stuff with no interaction from God. For 400 years, they would go to the temple, and they would do every single, t every, every command that was commanded of them. Every day. They were lighting the candle, redoing the oil, everything for 400 years. And nobody ever came out of the holy and holies and said, "Woo, I felt God. Nothing. Numbness, deadness. It's crazy to think about. So he decides, I need to prepare the world 
for my son. So he sends an angel to Zechariah. Now, we're going to look at two reports that Gabriel gave. But they're for us today, okay? So let's go to Luke chapter 1. I'm not reading out of this Bible. We're going to start. Um, okay, let's go to 5. Verse 5. Ultimately, God had to prepare four people. He had already had people waiting. Simeon, Anna. There are different people who had been praying constantly, given their lives to prayer and intercession about the coming of our Lord. So they were already prepared to decide, but now there's going to be four people who are going to be smack dab in the middle of this life-changing, monumental moment of heaven, shifting everything that anything that the world has ever seen. Everything changes right here. Life as you know it was changed because of this moment right here. So we have Zechariah, Elizabeth, Mary, and Joseph, four people who were given the responsibility of changing the silence of God to the message that heaven has come. And what I find amazing are the four different responses from four people who God chose to use. It says in verse 5, During the rule of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest assigned service in the regiment of Abiel. His name was Zechariah. His wife was descended from the daughters of Aaron. Her name was Elizabeth. Go ahead, babe. We're going to write for a while. Uh, Together they lived honorably before God, careful in keeping to the ways of the commandments and enjoying a clear conscience before God. Yeah. There was no conviction. Of course, their consciences were clear. But they were childless because Elizabeth could never conceive. And now they were what? Everyone say it. Quite old. Not just old. They were quite old. Okay. So it so happened that as Zechariah was carrying out his priestly duties before God, working the shift assigned to his regiment, just doing his thing, he came, it came to his one turn in life to enter the sanctuary of God and burn incense. I, I just want to say something here. Poor Zechariah. We're about to get a little harsh on Zechariah, okay? But we love him. I'm not trying to be mean about Zechariah, but he was kind of, Anyways, when I, get, when I get to heaven, I'm going to ask Zechariah a very important question. I'll tell you that what it is in a second. So anyways, he's going in to burn the incense. This is the one time in his entire life he gets to do it. Come on. Woo! This is a monumental moment just for him personally. Look, he could be going in there and being found dead. They found it. They actually, I watched a thing the other day. They actually found the, the, the bell in the temple where they uh, were doing some excavation. They found one of the priest's bell that was on his, on his uh, thing. Crazy. He, the guy said, I picked it up, and I thought, I think it is a bell. He, went, he goes, and then I shook it, and I heard the bell. <laughs> That's pretty funny. So in this moment, he, he's like, i got to make sure I'm all good, like, from head to toe. Outwardly, i got to be cleaned and right. Inwardly, i got to get my stuff together. And he has to go in there with fear and trembling. His butt pucker was pretty high, okay, because, you know, he knows what could happen if he goes in there and he's, He's full of sin, hasn't atoned himself correctly with all of the rules and regulations that he was given. He could actually walk into the Holy Holies and he could pass out dead. I don't know about you, that's not the job I would like to have. I mean, I'd be like, no, give it to somebody else. I'm totally cool back here. Washing. (laughs) But if we stay back there, dormant, we don't get to encounter the Holy of Holies. We don't get to encounter the mercy seat. So dormant is a lot more fun out here. I'm just washing my hands. So so anyways, I want you to make sure you have Zechariah's heart. Y'all be Zechariah this morning right now and be like, I am so scared. I do not want to go in there. But he has to go. It's his job. He has to. The congregation was gathered and praying outside the temple at the hour of the incense offering. I don't know about you, like, everyone's watching me go in, and, oh, my God, I'm probably going to die, and they're going to drag me out. Like, all these people are going to see me do this. (laughs) 
So he's inside and now unannounced. I love this. Jesus never is like, hello, are you home? Can I come in? Like, he's, look, can we just be real? You know he's probably shaking a little bit, maybe freaking out a little bit. I don't know if he knew somebody else who had gone in and died. I don't know. I mean, like, we don't know what happened in his life. So he's coming into the place where he has to get everything just right. And out of nowhere, if you were, like, so into what you were doing that you knew if you didn't do it just right, you were going to die, and a huge angel pops up in front of you and says, hey, 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 I'm here. Like, you'd be like, like, can I have some wipes, please? I think I may have had an accident. I mean, like, for real. Because you know when you're nervous about doing something, your, your guts get all stupid. You know what I mean? So now he's already nervous and in there. Now he comes up and he surprises him, like, ah, I'll let it go. <laughs> Unannounced, an angel of the Lord appeared just to the right of the altar of incense. <laughs> Zachariah was paralyzed in fear. This would be the proper response, Okay. I have seen one angel in my lifetime. It wasn't Gabriel. And all I can tell you is they are humongous. Oh, amazing. And beautiful. Oh, my God. So beautiful. So Gabriel says, don't fear, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Elizabeth, your wife, will bear a son by you, and you are to name him John. You're going to leap like a gazelle for joy. And not only you, but many will delight in his birth. He'll achieve great stature with God. He'll drink neither wine nor beer. He'll be filled with the Holy Spirit from the moment he leaves his mother's womb. He will turn many sons and daughters of Israel back to their God. He will herald God's arrival in the in the style and the strength of Elijah, soften the hearts of parents to children and kindle devout understanding among hardened skeptics. He'll get the people ready for God. Zechariah said to the angel, you expect me to believe this? I'm an old man and my wife's an old woman. Everyone stay with me, quite old. Oh no, you don't, quite old. Okay, so. They weren't middle-aged, okay? They were old. Although middle-aged now is young, because I'm in it, I guess. <laughs> Although I don't know if I want to live that long. Anyways, um, so they are super old. They have been living a very long time on the earth, and they're old. And Gabriel shows up out of nowhere on Zechariah's most scariest day ever in his entire life and says, I'm here. God's heard your prayer. Zechariah be like, are, are you kidding me? You didn't answer the prayer when I was able. You didn't answer the prayer when she wasn't that old. He thinks this is ridiculous. I find it absolutely amazing. That Gabriel did not come in there and say, you've been chosen by God to be a father who's going to you know, prepare the way for the Messiah. Nothing. He says, I am here because God heard your prayer. Mm -mm -mm. How many of you probably would agree with me that Zechariah totally forgot he prayed that prayer? He probably wrote it off because it was never going to happen, right? Because now everything in the natural ain't working the way it's supposed to be working, and neither do me as an old person want to deal with a newborn. Amen. As a grandparent, I just want to say it takes two of us because <laughs> I'm exhausted if it's just me. I can do them by myself for maybe 30 minutes. And then I need my husband with me, as much as I love them. Just give them marshmallows. They'll be okay. <laughs> Ken and Negron used to come over to my house every once in a while to watch, and he would eat. He'd come to my house to have chocolate Pop-Tarts and marshmallows. Yeah. 
then I would send him home. Remember that, Cannon? Watching open season, I remember that. So he says, I'm here to answer your prayer. And maybe, possibly, if he was like me, he probably was a little irritated. Like, this is not a joke, people. This is my life. Don't be telling me you heard my prayer. You should have answered when it was time to answer. (laughs) Because now it's too late. How do you expect me to believe this? Today, we'd be like, that's retarded. No. But God heard his prayer. I want you to think about that in your own life. How many times have we with such earnest heart prayed for something that we even knew was the will of God? Come on, because we're we're told in the word of God that her having a baby was the will of God. And if she wasn't having a baby, it's probably because she had sin in her life. There was shame over their household. People who love God, there was shame over their household because she couldn't have babies. And their life, all the people they hung out with, had small group with, went to eat after church on Sunday with all those people. They all had their babies, and now they're all, they, now they're having grandchildren. Here I am. You never answered my prayer. There's been shame on my life forever. I earnestly sought your face, and you never answered my prayer. And how many times do we know God's spoken to us, and we pray earnestly, and we believe? I don't know about you guys, but I can have some faith to believe sometimes, and then I get no answer, and it is horrible. And there's such a disappointment because your expectations have been dashed. And I have walked this out personally for myself more than once in the last two years especially. Because there's nothing God has done according to the way I thought needed to be done. And then he reminds you of something you said or something you prayed. It makes me mad. I'm like, you said these things, and none of these things are happening. And now you want to show up today and tell me you heard my prayer. His response is a lot like ours. When he left this place that day, (laughs) speechless, I might add, because he questioned Gabriel, how do you expect me to believe this now that we're old? And Gabriel said, in Annette's term, buddy, I am Gabriel. I stand the presence of God. Shut up. He's telling Zechariah, I was just now sitting, standing right next to the throne of God. He stand there and the father says, go tell Zechariah. Why? Because God had been waiting for the day that Zachariah's straw was picked and he had to go into the Holy of Holies. And because silence had been going on in the world for 400 years, the Lord had to speak to him in that place. There was something about Zechariah and Elizabeth that was absolutely pure and holy before God. The word tells us in the Amplified Version that they were righteous. That Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous before the Lord and blameless. I can tell you without a shadow of a doubt, neither one of them felt righteous or felt blameless. Because their life announced to them all the time, you have no kid, you have shame. So Zechariah has a thought process. Subconsciously even, God's forgotten all about me. I wonder if there was a little angst in his heart having to go into that place and serve this God where he may have to give his life, but he's felt disappointed by the very God he has to go in there and serve. Can we be real? We walk in these doors with disappointments all the time failures. We just knew God was going to do something and we said it and prophesied it. We prayed over it and we come to the door and nothing happened. Or even worse, the opposite happened. Mm -mm. 
you really expect me to believe this? He heard the prayer I prayed 20 years ago. Come on. He's 20 years late. Is he? Or is he right on time? Let me tell you what. Old Zechariah's perspective had a great little overhaul in that moment with Gabriel. Now, I can tell you this. When he came out looking a little stunned, <laughs> just slightly, I mean, like, you know, you know how it is. You know how some people, like, get off the floor after they've been drunk and playing the spirit and they have that look on their face? We have a couple pictures, don't we? <laughs> they had that look. You just know they're wasted on new wine. They look foolish. So here comes this, you know, priest. He's an important dude. He's coming out looking a little drunk. And he can't say nothing to nobody. I want to know how that went when he got home to Elizabeth. Because the word tells us, I think he says it right away, it says, uh, when he talks about, oh, I can't look on here. It says he straightway went to, um, What's her face? Elizabeth. La, la, la. After your wife. Okay, now in the sixth month. Uh, hang on. I don't remember. It says somewhere in there that as soon as uh, he went home, that it came to pass that straightway Elizabeth became pregnant. So that means he had to go home to his old wife as a really old man, not being able to say, Honey, I love you, God said. It's you and me get some leavened bread and <laughs> a little bit of wine. He had to draw it out. <laughs> he had to mime it. <laughs> he has to communicate with his wife somehow that they have to have a little fun in the bedroom because he saw an angel who said he heard his prayer and she's going to be pregnant. I have no idea how that went down between Zechariah and Elizabeth, and I cannot wait to find out. I can't wait. I, I'm going to ask Zachariah. I'm like, first of all, dude, how long was it ago that you prayed and asked God? And how in the heck did you communicate this to Elizabeth and her be okay with it? I have no idea whatsoever. I, I want to see it, honestly. I just be like, like a movie. But look, remember, everything about this situation going on with John being born, is alignment of heaven, okay? At the appointed time that Zechariah is supposed to be in there that day, the only day of his life he's going to be in that place, he has to go in because God has been silent, and he has to go in there so he can hear the word of the Lord because everything's changing. And he, God has to use man in the prophetic on the earth to announce what God is about to do. And he bound himself to the order that he would communicate to people by. So he goes home to Elizabeth, however that shakes down. She's pregnant, and she's overjoyed. She's super happy. I have a feeling that she didn't even think twice about it because she said, all of my shame, all of my doubt, everything, all my guilt, everything that's been hanging over my head all these years is gone. She didn't care if she was old. Didn't matter if she was old. No more guilt and no more shame. Look, guys, he has answered our prayers. He has. But the problem is when we're dormant, we don't want to go in there, so we stay out here and wash our hands and do all the other jobs because going into the Holy of Holies is frightening. And we get mad and won't go in there because God's withholding something that we desire and he didn't answer. So we stay out here and expect the same response if we were in the Holy of Holies. And he's not going to come out of there because it's on you to draw near first unto God. He's showing you he loves you just by the fact that he's here and can, you can come to him. Oh, Jesus. Amen. I love you. I hope you know that. The Message Bible says, I think it's the message, maybe the voice. 
when Elizabeth became pregnant, she says, the remedy has come. The remedy for barrenness has come. The remedy for silence on the earth has come. The earth was, the earth was sick. People were sick. They needed a, re a remedy to help them, and it had come. Now, for six months, she's bringing this baby inside of her womb, and then Gabriel's going over to see Mary. Now, Mary and Elizabeth are vitally connected, not just because they're aunt, she had said her, it's aunt and niece. That's not why. It's because the prophetic that's inside of Elizabeth needs the Jesus inside of Mary. And the Jesus inside of Mary needs the John inside of Elizabeth because heaven and earth cannot align until those two people, those two fetuses are together. Now, let's read that real fast, and I'm going to kind of shift it just slightly. We're going to go to verse 26. It says, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to the Galilean village of Nazareth. To a virgin engaged to be married to a man descended from David, his name was Joseph, and the virgin's name was Mary. Upon entering, Gabriel greeted her, good morning. You're beautiful with God's beauty. Beautiful inside and out. God be with you. She was thoroughly shaken, wondering what was behind a greeting like that. But the angel assured her, Mary, you have nothing to fear. God has a surprise for you. That's some surprise. You remember those pregnancy tests? <laughs> uh oh Okay. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son and call his name Jesus. He'll be great. Be called son of the highest. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will rule Jacob's house forever. No end ever to his kingdom. Mary said to the angel, but how? I've never slept with a man. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the highest hover over you. Therefore, the child you bring to birth will be called Holy Son of God. And did you know that your cousin Elizabeth conceived a son? Old as she is. Her oldness is pretty important, apparently. Everyone called her barren, and here she is, six months pregnant. Nothing, you see, is impossible with God. And Mary said, yes, I see it all now. Come on. <laughs> I'm the Lord's maid, ready to serve. Let it be with me, just as you say. And then the angel left her. All right. The first seed... Word of God, human womb, seed of a man. Second, human womb, seed of the Father, divine seed. But we know that everything that happens on earth that's going to be in heaven, there needs to be both. There needs to be the natural side of it and the spiritual side of it, Okay. Now, when Mary gets over to Elizabeth's house, John feels for the first time the spirit of the living God inside of Jesus. And as soon as Mary gets over there, her, Elizabeth, her belly just leaps because she feels her son move. Because in that moment, there was an activation that happened to John by the spirit of God that was in Jesus. And both of these women are carrying babies who are going to shift everything for all time. And we have one woman who forgot even that she couldn't even have babies no more. It was gone, forgotten. And we have one who never even had intercourse with someone and didn't even know how that all could work. But they're ordinary people, right? Just ordinary folk living their ordinary life. Nothing about them supreme. They're just people, regular people. I preached a message a couple weeks ago called um, about the uh, extraordinary faith in the ordinary. 
how everything extraordinary in our life happens by us doing the ordinary, everyday, mundane things. And I found today this confirmation in my heart about how everything that the Lord does in extraordinary ways, he uses ordinary people with little bit of faith, or even in Zacharias, no faith. Aren't we always trying to build our faith up? i got to have more faith. God, help my faith. I want to have more faith. Because if I had more faith, then all these things could come to pass. It doesn't take a lot of faith. It takes ordinary people having ordinary things. This is the God of heaven and earth. He's tiny. I want you to imagine God shrinking himself down into a sperm and placed inside of a womb of a little girl. Because that's exactly, see, we, we go to Jesus in the manger and we see the baby. And he's a cute baby. I'm sure he was adorable. He's probably short, you know, he's probably cute, chubby. And we start everything about Jesus at the manger. Or when Mary finally ends up with Elizabeth. And we're like, there's the encounter of the Spirit of God in John. Here, this is where. But I want you to understand that he was present even before that. He shrunk himself down into a sperm. The tiniest that you can be. He's transformed all of that power, all of that godness, all of that Zoe life in him. And he let himself be contained in something that we can't even see unless we have a microscope. So because of that, I think that there may be some God things trying to be birthed in our lives, but because we can't see it with our eye, it's not God. Because we can't imagine God being that tiny. We need to imagine God being that tiny. That's why when you're at the, at the restaurant, you feel something inside of you. It's that tiny God speaking to you. We don't think that God can come down to our level. And he went further than our level. I think we try to make all of this stuff with God so extraordinary. And God, please believe me, I'm not trying to, to say it's not extraordinary because it is, because miracles and impossible things happen when God shows up. But do you know that miracles and impossible things happen when he's just tiny and you can't even see him in what you're doing? All you have is a word. All you have is the spirit of God is coming and will hover over you. And even if you felt the hover, maybe you didn't feel the sperm being implanted. I'm sure she didn't. And if the sperm is implanted, how long did she have to wait until her body began to feel the results and the, and the things that happens to a woman's body when she knows she's pregnant? See, Zechariah doubted because he shows us the fatherhood of the natural. His name is God remembered. He's, he's showing us that in the natural, there's no faith. There's only doubt. He couldn't believe. And yet God still used him. He gave the most amazing testimony about John and the Messiah. It's beautiful. But we see here that sometimes God has to shut our mouth so that the seed can be implanted and grow. Because let me tell you what, after that, when Mary showed up and said, hey, Uncle Zechariah, guess what? The Holy, Holy Spirit hovered over me, and I'm, now I'm pregnant. Let's just say that happened. I am pretty sure because he had his little check at the altar. When Mary came and told him that, he was like, Blessed are thou, old woman. Because you know he can't be thinking. 
If God already did what he did with Elizabeth, then when Mary comes and reports what God has done with her, all of a sudden it seems more feasible. And now you've got two people on the earth who are saying God has done the impossible. There's always this confirmation between what heaven and earth are doing. Oh, Jesus. It's a wonder. It really is. I wrote down. This powerful God becomes so tiny. How could this simple, tiny sperm and then this simple, tiny fetus be the all-power redeemer that we've been waiting for? There's no fanfare. There's no earthquake. Nothing monumental happens on the earth. There's just an angel in a sanctuary that nobody else can go into. And a woman at home, maybe doing laundry. This is how God decided to announce his son. It just stuns my heart because I get so mad at myself because sometimes I'm just looking for that impossible thing to happen. I want the impossible answer to come. I want God to move in a, ma- in a miracle way in my life, and I completely skip over all the ordinary little things in my life because there's no fanfare. But heaven split open that day, and God came down in a sperm. And we don't believe it because we only want the full-grown Jesus. We only want the baby Jesus. You need to have the fetus Jesus in your life, beloved. Because extraordinary things happen in very ordinary people living ordinary lives. We love the goosebump, and so do I. I love it. But that doesn't mean that's what we always need. Zachariah had to be faithful to go into that place and do what he was supposed to do. And beloved, let me tell you this. It's up to us to be faithful every single day to go sit before him like we're called to do. And that's, and you fight devotion. You fight intimacy. You fight reading your word. You fight having prayer time by yourself. And then you wonder, why is God not answering me? Why can't I hear him? Because you're not where you're supposed to be. And in that place, you hear the word of the prophet who's coming. Because you have to be Elizabeth and Mary. You have to be Zechariah and Joseph. And we fight the secret place. We fight being alone with him because we don't understand the value of the tiny Jesus. Every woman in here, when she got pregnant, had to have faith to believe a pregnancy test if she was pregnant. The first time, most of us have no idea. The second time we know it because our body immediately gets nine months pregnant on day two. (laughs) Amen. From all the women. It takes a while for our body to begin to change its cravings, to set itself up to be the, a, a proper temple to bring forth a baby. You have to have all these hormones different release, and your cravings change. You decide you, your body says you need tomatoes, and you hate tomatoes, but all of a sudden tomatoes are awesome. And you want pineapples and dill pickles. Amen. And everything about your life changes because of this thing inside of you you can't even see. It's the exact same thing in the spirit. Some of, we're fighting with God. I want, to, I want your direction. I want to hear you. I want all these things. And we only, we only want when everything inside of us is changed to know that he's there. But when you're first pregnant, it can be four months before your cravings start changing. And the cravings is your indication to confirm there's something inside of you growing. See, spiritually, it's the exact same way. You have to care for yourself and begin to, I'm sure she's rejoicing, telling, I'm pregnant. She's probably excited. I'm pregnant. I'm pregnant. God overshadowed me. I'm pregnant. She didn't see a baby. 
She probably didn't feel the baby, but she was pregnant. She even went to her aunt, I'm pregnant. God did this to me. And how long did it take before she began to have everything inside of her change so that what she was putting inside her body was adjusted because of the very thing that she was carrying? That's what happens to us in the spirit. We have to trust us, spending time with God, spending time with his word, doing, taking our daily vitamins, blah, that all those things are causing what's in us to become an impossible possibility. No fanfare. No earthquake. No fog, glory cloud, no gold dust falling from the ceiling. Nobody's feeling feelings filled with gold. No arms grown out, nor withered hands straightened. No eyes open, no ears opened. He's in the tiny, beloved. We should honor him in the tiny. Let's pray for just a moment. Oh, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your word. Lord, we just ask for forgiveness where we have only been searching and seeking the fanfare, the great grand sign. Father, I ask that you begin to stir our hearts again with the very simple faith that just says, okay, you said it, I believe it. Father, I just thank you that you are the God who makes all things possible. Lord, I ask that we would be carriers of your seed, of your word. We would nurture the seed inside of us so that we can birth an awakening and harvest that you deserve. If you're in here today and you had that that prick on your heart or that knowledge, that word that that God spoke that one thing to you and you know you have to respond to him. That could be for salvation or that could be for you to go back to the beginning where you say, be it unto me, according to your word. If either of those is what's happening in your heart right now, I'd like you to come forward. I would like the pastors to pray with you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father.
Though there's two people that something small has been given to you. And um, I was supposed to preach this morning and I felt like the word the Lord had laid on my heart was gift. And Jesus came as a small child, being the savior of the world in a small package. Pastor Annette kind of preached about along those lines. I feel like there's there's at least two people that something small has been given to you into your life. I don't know. It may have been just a word. It may have been money. I, I don't limit to what it was. But the Lord says it's going to develop into something major and very prosperous. I don't know if that's money, souls, whatever, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to be very prosperous in what it does. The Lord says, do not despise small beginnings. And he's about to cause it to rapidly grow and mature and just trust him and don't despise the small thing that's been given. Father, we love you. We praise you. We give you all honor, all glory. Can you all stand, please? Join hands. Father, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for the gift of your son. We thank you, Father, for that sweet baby that grew up to be a man that became bold enough to lay down his life, to trust you to be rose from the grave, to be empowered and dude from on high by the Holy Spirit, to show us the way, Father God to walk as a man on this earth full of God. Let us follow that example, Father. We love you and we praise you. We give you all honor and all glory. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Don't remember, read your bulletins Sunday the 24th. We are not going to have service. We want you to stay home and be with your family that weekend. Enjoy that time, so uh, keep that in mind. We love you. We'll see you next Wednesday. Bring a friend, bring an enemy, bring somebody. Be quiet as they're finishing up.